now. Okay. So welcome again. This is Introduction to Research. Um, and hopefully y'all will learn a lot about just uh, what research is and how to get involved with it. Um, and today's guest speaker doing this presentation is Dr. Katrina Popichak. Um, and this presentation will also be kind of through a biological sciences lens since that is her area of expertise. So I'll briefly introduce her and hand it right over to her to get us started. So um, again, we have Dr. Katrina Popichak, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Pathology. So please help me welcome her into the space with how you're comfortable either with um, the reactions or the chat box. Um, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Nicolette. Um, so thank you for all coming. I appreciate it. Um, I'm actually looking at uh, Vanessa. It looks like I love that you have your your major in science concentration right there. That's awesome. I might steal that from you or recommend our students do that. Um, but yes, as Nicolette, Nicolette said, um, I'm Katriana Pop. Oh, uh oh, trying to hear you. Well, if you if you have something to say, Vanessa, go ahead and pop in. We just didn't hear you. Okay, I'll keep going. So uh, Nicolette was wonderful enough to let me, I'm, I'm excited to be the first person to give you a bit of an introduction into what research is. And then just some of the, the opportunities um, that you can pursue depending on your degree or, or even not, if you wanna look at uh, do research in an area that maybe you're not even majoring in. And so I'm just gonna to talk to you about some of the resources and some of the, um, the things you can do and, and how to be proactive in, in making those connections. And it's nice because I see two names already that I recognize. So I'm excited to have you all here. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in and I don't anticipate taking probably more, like if I just go, it'll probably be about a half hour, but I want you all please to feel comfortable with, with talking. And I've got a few questions for you. So I'll be poking and prodding a little bit. And I just, I want you to ask questions and feel comfortable to do so. So um, as Nicolette said, reactions, chat, or if you wanna just, just chat in general, like on camera or off camera, that's totally okay. If my computer will cooperate. Okay, so I was gonna introduce myself first. Nicolette and I were talking, oops, Oh my gosh, there we go. We were just talking about actually as people were popping in my obsession with my cats. So I had to share, this is Chloe and this is Winston. And I'm just really in love with this picture because uh, my primary research focus is neuroimmunology. And that began as an under, when I was an undergraduate student. So I started in at CSU in, oh gosh, 2007. Um, so a while ago, and I had no clue what I wanted to do. I was thinking I wanted to go to vet school, but still wasn't entirely sure. And um, I'm a first generation college student. So no one in my family had went to college. Um, they had high school and that was about it. And so um, I got really lucky. I, and if you haven't already done so, make sure you apply, apply to the CSUSA scholarship application, because that's what worked for me. And I got a scholarship that gave me the opportunity to work in a laboratory and um, I ended up starting work in Dr. Ron Chalkin's lab and he does Parkinson's disease research, but I started as a freshman and I was terrified. I had no clue what I was doing. And I, my eyes were just, just bugged out of my head for quite some time because it was intense. It was, it was very unique and an experience I was really not aware of. And so I, I had some really wonderful mentors and I, like I said, I just feel like I got very lucky in being able to start research early. And as I progressed, it became apparent to me that vet school wasn't necessarily what I was looking for. Um, even I grew up around animals and, and my family's in veterinary medicine, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily have the competitive streak that I was seeing in a lot of the pre-vet students. And as I progressed in research, I started to learn how to ask the questions that I had. I was very curious about everything and anything. And again, I had some really great mentors. So I got really lucky that in that respect, graduated with a bachelor's in microbiology. And that took me a while to realize that was the major that I wanted. I didn't even know microbiology was a major or a concentration now, I guess. And um, just really fell in love with the topic and fell in love with, honestly, with the teachers, the instructors of, of microbiology. 
I ended up still kind honestly not knowing what I wanted to do. Even when I graduated as an undergrad, I was a bit burnt out. I'm not going to lie. And so I took a semester off and I went and I was a laundry girl at the VTH. So I washed bloody, bloody towels and whatnot. And it was the best decision to give me that break and realize, no, I want grad school. I want to, I want to focus on science. And so um, I actually stayed in Dr. Ron Chalkin's lab. He's wonderful, but also because he had the funding, funding is, is very helpful and got my degree in 2018. And just as I progressed, realized that I just, I love teaching and I love seeing what I call um, like light bulb eyes when just the idea it is, is makes sense to the student. And so I got really lucky in getting a position here in microbiology. I just started last year. And so I teach the majority. I, I teach about 65% and I teach uh, microbiology. I, like I said, I recognize some of your names from MIP 300. And then I teach immunology as well as a portion of microbiology lab. So trust me, this has a, this has a role in future stuff that we're going to chat about. So the research that I do is both scientific, looking at neuroinflammatory response in the brain and how that relates to diseases like Parkinson's disease, those neurodegenerative diseases. How does the immune response um, play in, in these all of these processes? And then I also do education research. And I it only just in the past year or so have I realized that education research is a thing and it's very unique area of study and very different from scientific research, but it's, it's also really interesting as well. So I'll talk to you a, a bit about that and sort of what kind of research that entails. So if you have any questions for me or my experiences, I could probably talk for <laughs> forever, but it's just, it's, it's really trippy to think about having started as an undergraduate student and, you know, have, have gotten this far and I'm continuing to do research. And it's my, my primary goal to have undergraduates in the lab and um, in and, and doing scientific research, but then also doing education research as well. So we have a few undergraduate students who help us do that too. So if you have questions again, just feel free to pop on in. Okay, so I know that we don't have as many. I think it's a smaller group, which I actually prefer. And I'm hopeful that I can get some discussion going, even if it's via the chat. But I want to know about you. I'd like to know what year you all are, um, or you know, if equivalent, freshman, sophomore, junior, just to get a bit of an idea of, of who you are. So please take a moment to either put your answer in the chat, or if you feel comfortable, just popping in and, and announcing what year you are, please. I'm a sixth year. <laughs> I know you. Hi. I know Sarai. Maybe I can get her to talk a little bit later about how she got a job in a research lab. Well, I'm a first year. Oh, yay. Okay, cool. We're getting to somebody early. Maybe help you get into the lab or not even the lab, whatever, we'll, we'll talk about your major here in a moment. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to see the chat. Let's see. First year, okay, so we've got some babies. You're not babies, you're adults. Baby adults. <laughs> I'm a junior. Awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. Jeffrey's a fourth year, Rachel's a first year. Okay, this is nice, I like this. I like that we have a good range. Okay, keep going. Is anyone a graduate student or anything? Okay, I figured, I was just checking. Okay, we're gonna keep going. Thank you for all for participating. The, uh, the big question, the one that looms over you every time you go to family functions or <laughs> what major are you or what is, the, what is your concentration? I may not have it listed here, so please let me know. Zoology major with a minor in horticulture. Oh man, that's cool. I did, I did know that. That's so awesome. Thank you, Sarai. Um, mine is a, I'm in biomedical engineering with chemical and biological engineering. So a dual degree. Oh, that's some smarty majors you've got going on there. That's awesome, Richard. I can, I, my husband is an engineer and I've got a lot of engineering friends, so. 
I have some ideas about how to how to connect you with engineering focused research as well. And if you're if you don't aren't comfortable with talking, please feel free to just throw that in the chat. I just like to get a bit of an idea because I do have some uh, some examples related to research. I'm a horticulture major, science concentration with a minor in soil science. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Vanessa. Okay, we've got our good science majors here. Is anyone here not necessarily biological science or engineering? Okay. Well, then I will, will continue to emphasize the biomedical science focus. Okay. So I was going to ask you all, and, and is anybody comfortable going into breakout rooms? I want to. I, I want us to all sort of get to know each other, especially since it's a smaller group. So I want you to consider what words come to mind when you think of a scientist or a researcher, and would you consider a scientist and a researcher as the same thing? You guys comfortable with going to breakout rooms for a few minutes? Okay. And I'll pop in Ooh, as well. Let's do it, right? I can do that as a co-host, right, Nicolette? Okay. If things would pop up. Do I have to unshare? Oh, there we go. Awesome. I'll do three rooms. So I will call you all back in three minutes. Does that sound okay? Nothing too crazy? Okay. Okay. And far more knowledge in this area and being able to compare and contrast scientists and researcher and some of the words that you think of it, when I was an undergrad I'd have been like I don't know so um, y'all are, are far more advanced than I was when I started out so if you feel comfortable because I do have a couple of people I talked to who I think will be but if any of you feel comfortable what words did you discuss that came to mind when you think of a scientist and, or a researcher? And do you consider a scientist and researcher to be the same thing? I know there's some of you. I might call on Sarai because she oh, can handle on me. Um, oh, yeah. So, oh, no, go for it, Richard. Um, what came to my mind was like lab coats. And so, because usually you, you always think of them working in a lab and, you know, having their protective, like the PPE. And mm -hmm. so like lab coats, goggles, all those sorts of things. Then also, um, I thought that they're like kind of similar, a scientist and a researcher, because they both have like um, science methods in their work. And mm -hmm. they both kind of do um, that method of checking their work and you know, doing it over again and checking their work to see if what they're doing is correct. I agree. And that that's a big component for sure, especially mm -hmm. from the science, the scientific standpoint. Absolutely. So I, I love what Richard just said. Um, there's more, of course, too. So does anyone else have any any thing that they think of? Jeffrey, do you feel comfortable? Yeah, I can share a little bit. Um, so yeah, um, I think a scientist is a researcher and the difference between a scientist or a researcher is probably um, a scientist, they probably got their uh, doctoral degree or maybe, and they're just doing like more advanced research. And whereas a researcher, they might be, um, you know, like currently a graduate student and yeah, they're working towards their degrees. Yeah, that's, my thoughts. I love it. Thank you so much, both of you, for volunteering. I'm not going to pick on everybody because we're, we'll get going. Um, and I, do, you're, you're both right. And a lot of what we talked about in the few breakout rooms that I was in, you're correct. But also, you all are currently researchers. You're in school and you are researching certain areas of interest 
whether or not it's engineering, chemical engineering or horticulture or soil sciences or zoology, you are a researcher already. And when I think of a scientist, I, I guess I think of them as being reasonably interchangeable, but also you can be a student scientist or student researcher too. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the types of science that you can do, um, the type of research you can specifically focus on depending on your area of interest. And then um, just kind of talk about some of the things you can do to, to make some connections and figure out where it is you, you wanna go if that's what you decide you wanna do. But I want you to know that those opportunities are there for you. And I just wanna give you some of those resources. So I sometimes feel like this is actually what people think of when they think of scientists. And honestly, I feel like all six of them are not incorrect. <laughs> you know, we're not necessarily putting ears on mice, but there's mouse research. Um, we're not making math, or at least I hope not. If you know Breaking Bad, that's what that, <laughs> that image is. But the PPE is there, just as Richard had mentioned. Of course, we've got Bill Nye, the science guy. Am I old for referencing him? Are there some youngins who don't know who he is? I hope that's not the case because he's pretty awesome. And then we've got, I think it was that Meeker, is that the right? Like I always want to call him Beaker or Meeker, but Muppet who's uh, setting some things on fire. And yes, sometimes that does happen. That's not always the goal. Um, Einstein, of course. And then, yeah, unfortunately there's some writing and there's some paperwork involved too. I suppose that depends on the direction you want to go. But I don't think I, that this is necessarily wrong. I think it's a culmination of everything that we see here. So thank you all for participating and being willing to, to chat with each other. So ask questions as we go, and I'm just gonna chat with you further. So these are those, those big questions, like what does research look like for my major? And we've got what roles and positions are available for different types of research. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about, I, I've obviously I can't hit on every single major or every single area of, of research, but I've got some examples for you and, and just some, some specific roles and positions depending on the things you're interested in. And then what are the different components to consider when doing research? So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So some of you had already said when you were thinking about being a scientist or, or being a researcher or doing research, you were thinking about the step-by-step -step process involved and needing to have a particular model and organization already really imposed before you can go in and even, even attempt some of the questions or try to answer some of the questions that you may have. And that is very true. And I'll talk to you about those momentarily. But I was curious about what research actually is, or even what, what the definition is. And I know that might sound boring, but it, I have a, a, another slide here in a moment that I think is, is far better than even just the definition you'd find on the Oxford, in the Oxford Dictionary. But, um, you know, boring definition is that it's a systemic, systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. Huh? I was like, I was pretty dull. This next one was a bit of a culmination of some in that research is a search for knowledge through an objective and systematic method of finding a solution to a problem. I liked that one a little bit better and it made me think of you all in your current studies at this point in time. You are searching for knowledge through an objective and systematic method. So taking classes, you have a curriculum, you have a set number of courses and you're doing so to try to find a solution to a problem. At this point, it might be, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? That might be your problem or question, but you are a researcher just by that definition. Um, I thought it was also interesting that research actually is a, is a, comes from French terminology to go about seeking. So in that respect, aren't we all researchers? We are constantly seeking, whatever that may be, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we have questions, we have, we have interests, and I hope that we have motivation. And so uh, the earlier, earliest recorded use was in 1577. And I guarantee there was research occurring far before then, but the, the use of that particular term happened five, 600 years ago. So it's been around for some time. And of course we start out with questions, right? If you're even remotely curious, you have a question, any question for that matter. How does this work? Why do people do that? Is there a, a, a trend occurring here in the way that these individuals are behaving or in the way that this disease is appearing in a certain population? 
And so it begins with seeing these things, with these observations, you start to have questions. So maybe you start to go to Google or to PubMed, or you start talking to, to professionals or people in this area of research to try and understand how that's occurring. You start to make connections. And I think that's one of the biggest components of doing research is that you're not necessarily, you're not just doing what you're told, but you're asking questions and you're making connections. And in doing so, you can formulate your own hypothesis. And as you begin as an undergraduate, you may be given a hypothesis by your PI or your mentor, whomever that is, but you yourself, you're gonna to start to formulate your own as well. And then you start to do experimentation. And we'll talk about what kind of experiments that can be. It's not always sitting at a bench top pipetting. So lots of options. And especially if you decide that wet labs or doing pipetting is not your thing, that is totally okay because we need people who can do other areas of research besides just pipetting. So I just thought that that was really interesting um, just to see that those were the definitions. But by and far, my favorite definition is from Zora, Zora Neale Hurston. She's one of my favorite authors. And she says that research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. And it is a seeking that he who wishes may know the cosmic secrets of the world and they that dwell therein. I am a huge fan of this definition because I'm, I'm also a big fan of poking and prodding my students, but I do, I do agree. It's just, it's formalized curiosity. So you're, you're writing these things down and you're keeping track of how it is that you're testing and answering the questions you have. And then you are poking and prying with a purpose. So I thought this was really beautiful and I, I appreciated it even more so because Zora Neale Hurston was not a benchtop scientist, but she was a social scientist. And she was a, an, an author and wrote some very beautiful, thought-provoking literature. But she's a researcher. And her definition to me, I think, is my favorite. So I just wanted to share that with you. OK, so I, of course, am sitting here like, oh, I do research. I do education research. I, I do the benchtop research search with the pipetting and the, and the lab coats. And so I, I started researching research and there are so many different types of research um, so it's just the pursuit of knowledge right you're asking questions you are searching for something and that's really what it is and so we can have applied research research in which you are actively within the laboratory and you're applying that knowledge you're, you're learning about experimentation that you can execute to try and answer questions um, we have analytical research which is going to be um, I, for me, I, I definitely see individuals analyzing data that is already there or information that has already been generated. And then you're attempting to make connections, whether or not it's through numbers or, or trends. Um, we have empirical research. Um, so that, that's gonna be where you will actively go in and you'll categorize certain things. And then we have the more, I think the more well-known areas of research being qualitative and quantitative. And what I was having trouble with when I was looking through at all these different types of research was the fact that they are categorized. And what I found was that a lot of them overlap and one area of research employs a lot of the other areas of research. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of those as well. Okay. So kind of boring, but I'll be quick. So we've got our descriptive, our analytical, exploratory, and predictive research. And so with descriptive research, it's that fact find finding. There's gonna be description of what is seen, very observational. And so my favorite uh, sort of example would be like that food pyramid that categorizes different food types. That's gonna be your descriptive research. It's describing and demonstrating the, the different types of fats, the different types of veggies, so on and so forth. We have our analytical that is anal an analysis based. So looking at existing data, analyzing that and making a critical evaluation. We have our exploratory where of course I, I would consider this almost like preliminary research in that you start to look into certain things and you in doing so, this is what helps formulate a hypothesis. And then your predictive research, um, this one is a little bit more less science, I guess, and more um, targeted toward toward business or marketing. 
And so my, what I, what I, again, what I find unique is that all of these really do converge. And one of the things that I think is really interesting in, in the laboratory I work in, we do benchtop science. We want to know why neurons are dying in neurodegenerative disease and we help or we, we, it's our goal to understand these diseases by studying behavioral changes and by being able to put that model, this human disease into an animal model, we can study the animal, in this case, a mouse, and look at the changes in movements. Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder. So we can say, yes, this drug looks like it's helping the mouse that has Parkinson's or no, it does not. And so we have undergraduates who were not wanting to do benchtop science and they weren't even necessarily wanting to work with the mice, but they're still able to do analytical research in this lab based off of behavioral analysis of the mouse. And so I have a video here for you. This mouse is in an automated tea maze. And so this mouse, and this is engineering at its finest, where you can go in and you can help design these different, um, different, different things. But this is an actual maze. And what's happening is this animal, this rat's movement and behavior is getting recorded by a computer. And so I think this is very intriguing. And what I like most about this is that there are multiple types of research depicted here just in this video. Um, you, in studying mouse behavior, you have behavioral sciences. Um, you've got engineering, absolutely, because this tea maze had to be designed and engineered. And then you have computer sciences and you have additional engineering because there's an algorithm that has to be created in order to be able to track the mouse, I think this is a rat actually in this, to be able to track the rat's movements, to be able to actually physically see the paw movements and see whether or not that mouse is behaving in a manner that we would normally see a neurodegenerative disease. And so the, the students in our laboratory, we have some that analyze the videos themselves. The algorithm has been set and these are not computer science students. They're not engineers, they're biological biology type students and they're doing this kind of work. But then we also have engineering students who are coming in and helping design things like this team maze. Again, if you have any questions, please pop in or, or throw them up in the chat for me, okay? Oops, we don't need to watch that again. Okay. So I talked just briefly about qualitative research and quantitative research, and I, I would be willing to say that both overlap. It's rare that you're going to have purely qualitative and purely quantitative. There's going to be qualitative research that leads to quantitative research and vice versa. But what I think about or what I like about qualitative research is that it's um, very important in behavioral sciences. And so um, a lot of what's utilized is that researchers will, um, or research will be designed to actually find out about how people feel or what it is that people think. And so it's very much behavioral sciences focused, but it's, it's not just, oh my gosh, what's going on in the mind, which of course is very important. And, and from a psychological standpoint, that's something you could help pursue, but also it's, it could be from a marketing standpoint. It can be from um, a, a commercialized type standpoint as well. So I, again, these are this is research. These are things that you can be a part of and that you can help do. Whether or not you are a volunteer and you're one of the the people who's getting, I don't want to say researched on. That sounds terrible, but but you're the one who's being shown images of maybe a, a marketing plan, and you needed to convey what it is that you're thinking, or you're the one who's recording and helping understand those individuals' feedback. And then the quantitative research you know, this one is based on quantity or amount, right? But I think, again, you could say, okay, well, 20 people had positive connotations with this image, whereas 30 did not. And you can start to figure out how you can make sense of those numbers and how statistically you can determine whether or not it's significant. So those are, are multiple things that you can do. Okay, take a quick moment. I wanna, I wanna transition for a minute. Um, so these are people sneezing. Do you all need to sneeze now too? Do you have an inclination to sneeze? I don't know. When I was looking up pictures of people sneezing, I'm, I was feeling that as well. So I want you to just take a second, look at the sneezing people. There's a reason for this. Okay. So there was a study done 
in 2010, actually, that showed that when people look at pictures of photos or pictures of photos, pictures of people sneezing, it increases those individuals' white blood cell counts just by seeing a picture of someone sneezing. I thought this was really interesting because you've got a combination of qualitative and quantitative research here. So this was done in, I believe in, in Britain. And so the National Health Service had put out this poster and I couldn't find a better image. So it's hard to read what's at the bottom, but it was a, a poster that's put out to the public that basically says like, wash your hands, cover your mouth, use a tissue. Um, some of the basic concepts that I think people forget until things like COVID come around. But they started to do, and it was a reasonably small study and there have been additional studies to back this up. But this one I thought was really intriguing because you've got researchers showing individuals pictures, asking for their response, but then you also have individuals who are physically drawing blood from those people before showing them pictures of people sneezing and then afterward and measuring the immune response, measuring the number of white blood cells as a result. So you've got some of that more clinical or scientific, but then you also have this qualitative psychological side or behavioral sciences component as well. And I thought this was just very interesting. And if anyone's curious, you can shoot me an email and I can send you the study. This was just the, the, the news release about it. But our minds and our, our, our emotional and mental is, is connected to our physical. And, and again, that is exactly how the research is. I think so many of these different areas are very connected. So whatever it is you're studying, you can do research. And again, this was just such a cool study. So now every time I see somebody like sneezing or you get that feel of sneezing, I'm like don't, don't hold it in, but oh, my immune system's going up and I'm already tired just thinking about it. <laughs> I just thought it was so interesting. Questions, comments, nothing. No one wants to give me a hard time. I was waiting for it. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So of course there's more types of research, oh my goodness. Um, but we have both applied research and we have fundamental or just basic pure research. And when I think of this basic pure research, I think of, of students. I think of you all in the pursuit of your degrees, whatever that may be. It's, it's general and it's a bit of a, especially as you start out, you've got to take those general courses to get that foundational knowledge to really pursue what it is that you're interested in. Um, but this fundamental or basic or pure research is really done um, for intellectual pleasure of learning. And I think that that is the fun foundation of research. I mean, you want to have some sort of, you know, intellectual pleasure of learning. Of course, that's the goal you're seeking. You're trying to, to answer questions that you or your laboratory has. And you can be a laboratory if you're even education research or you're, you don't have to have a physical lab in the white lab coat. Um, but then you also have applied research. And so this is something that I specifically do in trying to improve the human condition. Um, so treat or cure a specific disease. It is applied, it's action research because you're physically doing something. And it's not that you aren't physically doing something in basic or pure research, you are, but it's almost like applied is almost like basic or pure research with a purpose. Kind of like what Zora Neale Hurston said, you're, you're prying and poking and prodding with a purpose. So there's purposes with, associated with all of it. So there are other types of research, and I'm sorry for, for putting these in just a sort of categorical bit, but I have, I have a little bit more that I want to chat about with you. And so some of what I thought was interesting is that you can have one-time research or longitudinal, longitudinal research where you can study a group of individuals and how they're behaving over time. Um, so I think of, of nutrition. A lot of nutritional studies will implement um, a certain amount of fiber in, in individuals for a certain amount of time and they will work with them and ask them, how is this changing you? Or um, what, what do you think of this? So very, very nutritional psychology sort of component. There's field setting research or laboratory research or simulation research. I, I honestly just sort of combined it all together. And what I thought of was that was really intriguing is that if you aren't wanting to be stuck in a building, you don't have to be. You can be out in the field and you can actually help collect mosquitoes and you can study antibiotic resistance microbes that live in mosquitoes. 
or you can study mosquitoes and see what kind of diseases they may be transmitting in certain regions. Even at CSU, you can go to South America or Africa or other, other areas to collect mosquitoes and study those organisms. As an undergraduate, I might add, which I think is pretty amazing. There's clinical research and we're really lucky here at CSU because we have the veterinary teaching hospital and there is so much clinical research occurring. So if you feel that you have a bit more of an animal focus or you wanna to go to vet school maybe, it gives you the, the opportunity to see what kind of research is occurring at that clinical level. Um, there is historical research, so don't forget there actually is history. There's history majors and I've got some, some history professor friends who I sometimes tease, but they do historical research. I'm like, what are you researching? They're like, I'm actually looking at historical documents. I'm making connections. It's a bit more qualitative maybe, but it's still research. And then you have your, your empirical research and some of your con conceptual research. And I could go talk and talk and talk about some of the things that you can do, but there's so much connection and so many opportunities. And so I know I'm being a little bit vague here, so I have a bit more. So where could you go from here? I just threw a lot of stuff out at you and you're probably, some of you might be getting a bit bored. What can you do actively now to get involved in research? As nice as it would be to have somebody just email you and tell you, okay, we have a research position for you. It's rarely that. You've got to be proactive. You need to poke and prod and pry with a purpose. And my mama always says, squeaky wheel gets looped. So contact people, be polite, but be persistent. Talk to your advisor, especially if you're in an area that maybe I'm not familiar with. See what kind of opportunities they've heard of. I say email, 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 because that, especially now being all virtual, that really is gonna be your best option. And that's what I advise Sarai to do. And I might have her pop in and talk to you all about her experience if she's cool with it. Um, and then actually this one's really fun. Uh, the Creativity and Undergraduate Research Symposium, so the CURC, I don't know if any of you, I'm probably not saying it precisely, but this is when all of the undergraduate researchers on campus get together and they present their research in poster format. And then also some of them will do platforms. And I do believe it's open to all of CSU and I can um, get that information for you more specifically, but it's really neat because you can go in and you can listen to other undergraduates talk about some of their research and you can ask them questions. And then you can make connections and ask them if there's room in their area of research or if they have a PI or somebody you could talk to. Um, I also like the idea of being on the lookout for emails for seminars offered. Nicola and her group are awesome in that they are um, making a lot of different researchers available to you through some seminars and um, some symposia. So you will be able to come in and hear about what kind of research they do and then talk to them. I know that it might be a little bit scary, but they put their pants on the same way as us one leg at a time. And I encourage you to reach out to them. And worst case scenario, they say, no, I don't have room. And then, you know, you tried. Um, and then I also encourage you to talk with your instructors, your GTAs and other students. If you hear somebody is doing something research-based that you want to be a part of, talk to them and ask them how they got there and ask them if they can connect you with somebody. Okay, and then I am very, very happy if you want to email me if I don't necessarily have room in my lab, or I, I, I think I will soon, but if I don't necessarily have room, I know people who do, and I can put you into contact with them. And then also I'm very happy to look at the emails you want to send prior to sending, because sometimes that's scary too, um, but just talk to me too. I'm so happy to help out. And this is a plug a bit for microbiology department. I'm not sure if y'all, when I first started, I didn't know microbiology was even a thing. And our department's pretty, again, I'm biased because I come from the department. They're pretty cool. And I'm not even necessarily doing bacteriology. I do immunology, immunology of the brain, which is, is pretty special. So if you think you may be interested in something like that, I, I encourage you to reach out and see if microbiology would be something you want to do. And then there are so many, um, lab classes that can give you the opportunity to pursue or at least see if you're interested in doing bench-based science. Um, again, if that's not something you want to do, you don't have to, but I have one thing that I want to do with you. Do we have time? We do. I'm going to hurry up. I guess I am taking a longer time than I thought I was. I'm sorry. 
Okay, so this is what I would recommend you do, depending on what department you're in. And I'm actually gonna pop over to Google and share the Google page with you. This is what I suggest to most of my students. So, exit out. So you go to the Google and I'm gonna pretend that we're all in the Department of Microbiology for the moment, but this is what I would do. So if you just go to colostate.edu, it takes you to the, the main Colorado State University page. And this is really, really helpful. You can go over to the right here and click on the little search bar and you can type in any department you can think of. So I just do Department of MIP. So Microbiology, Immunology and Pathology. Go to the faculty page of that department. So you can, I mean, you can click on either one. Um, so if you go to the main department page, it looks something like this. Go away, we don't need you. If you click on the menu, you can go over to the faculty list. And some of the departmental sites are a little bit different, but I encourage you to look up the faculty and then you can go through and you can see what areas these particular faculty research. And what I'm really intrigued by is that we've got virology, we've got bacteriology, we have clinical pathology there. And you're like, what? what does any of this mean? But you can actually click on their name and most of them have sites or have write-ups about what it is they specifically study. If that is interesting to you in any way, shape or form, you can contact them. So if their information is not actively listed, if you go back to the CSU website, you can access the directory and type their name in and you can email them. And they are aware of this. Faculty get emails from students specifically expressing an interest in doing research with them. So they are aware and they're not gonna wrinkle up their nose at getting an email from you. And so if you keep going, you can read a little bit about what some of these faculty do and whether or not that's something you're interested in. The other thing I think is very cool, and I didn't get touch on it as much as I would have liked to, but for example, Dr. Hughesby does pedagogy research, so education research. And so if you think that you would be interested in learning how to teach better and how to implement better methods or ideas in teaching, then I would encourage you to reach out to those instructors too. And the other thing you can also do is you can TA. So in areas that you're interested in, it gives you the opportunity to learn that information more and then you get more connections with those instructors too. So peruse, see what is fa fascinating to you. Dr. Kelp does science communication research. How cool is that? And it's just, it's communication. How can we convey all of this crazy stuff that sounds very complicated and complex, but how can we convey it in a more understandable way? So I have talked your ears off. I know we're running low on time. So I am going to say that I'm done, but I'm going to hang out if you have any questions for me or, or you want to connect or you want to get my email. I'm so happy to, to interact with you and work with you. So that is it. Thank you for having me. I hope you learned something or if nothing else, I, I made you excited to go search. Thank you, Dr. Poppychak. Um, I just wanted to open it up for questions if anybody has any questions before I close this out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarai. Sorry, I didn't actually end up putting you on the spot. <laughs> I have I have like one question. Yeah. Okay, so, because right now I'm in a research internship right now, but oh, since cool. that ends in spring, is but there's a would there be like a way that I could contact like the person in charge of the research right now that I'm in, and like what kinds of things should I say in order to like stay in the research? Ooh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, can I ask where do you what do you do? Where do you is it here yeah. at CSU? So, yeah, so it's part of the biomedical engineering department, and mm -hmm. we work with nano. Um, what is it? I like what this. Oh yeah, so we work with like titanium and biomaterials, 
and we're using like natural biopolymers to improve like bone healing and with like orthopedic implants and all that. Oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah. So you, it, who is your mentor? Who is the person you report to? Um, it's Dr. Popat. 